Well, the two things that hit you the hardest, one is photographs and the other is music. The thing to me is so great about this picture, if I may, what it always said to me was, I still am enamored and sort of in love with the city. He was in love with the city. You know, th yeah. that's what it always so During his immigration case, they tried to throw him out of America. And he said how much he enjoyed it being in New York. He actually, at one point, said, couldn't you just throw me out of Ohio? No offense, Ohio, <laughs> but can I stay in New York? You know, when he passed away, they asked for a picture to put in the memorial. They had uh, 10 minutes of silence in Central Park. And they asked me for a picture, and I asked if he wanted to see a few, and they said, no, nah, you knew the guy, you'll pick a good one. And, and at the time, Yoko had just put out a statement that, you know, not to blame New York. It wasn't that New York was dangerous, that the person who came to kill him came from around the other side of the world. And I tend to think that John died in New York because he lived in New York. You know, mm -hmm. he died going home. And so that's why I kind of picked this picture, because, you know, he was proud to be in New York. He said that if he lived in the time of the Romans, he'd live in Rome. But he lived in the 70s, and, he, and so he lived in New York, because he felt that was the center of the art world. I've had the rare opportunity to meet many amazing photographers who move through the different landscapes to create powerful images. I'm always inspired by how these images transform the way we see people and understand the world. A great photograph needs no explanation, but on capture, these incredible people tell the story of creating their most memorable images. I'm Mark Seliger, and this is Capture. Hey, I'm Mark Seliger, welcome to Capture. I'm here with Kevin Bacon, the American award-winning actor and director and photographer, and also musician, and Bob Gruen, the uh, legendary photographer. And uh, both of you, thank you for, for joining me today. Kevin, uh, you know, since you're our outside-of-the-box photographers, we like to <laughs> For say. For sure. <laughs> but, you know, I, I have to say, I had not seen your work, and it's great. I was trying to figure out, is it about film? Is it about his music? Is it about travel? You perform with your brother. Right. And uh, the Bacon Brothers. Bacon Brothers. Yeah. And you were like the, you know, the historian of the band, right? I mean, well, first off, let me just say to even be talking about my photographs in the presence of you guys is is is, is humbling <laughs> to say the least. It's 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 a little bit like. Uh, you know, excuse me, Miss Streep, can I do a monologue for you? <laughs> you <know? laughs> One of the things about Kevin's work, which is fascinating, is you've turned your camera back on the people that are taking your picture. Yeah. Which is, what is the shoot back the about? shoot back is, you know, when you get into a situation and somebody's taking your picture, which, which frankly, as great as it is and as much as I appreciate it, sometimes it can get a little irritating. So my way, in a way, of sort of trying to deal with this is to actually stop and take out my phone and just take pictures of the people taking pictures. And you'd be surprised how people are really shocked by that. I mean, they really <laughs> are very, also, oftentimes very uncomfortable. And you'll see pictures where I say, okay, now you, you all p pick up your cameras and take a picture of me and I'm gonna take a picture of you. It's called a shoot back. And a lot of people are like really kind of thrown by yeah, it. Yeah. This, is a, this is what a shoot back looks yeah. like. You know, I think there's a book in there for you. Would you ever consider that? I would. I mean, I've taken quite a few of them. Um, at one point, there was some discussion about it being sort of like an online thing that, that continues. A lot of people really respond to it. A lot of people were saying, oh my god, I wish I could get a shoot back. I wish I could get a shoot back. I hope I run into him with my camera. Bob's legendary journey through, you know, working with you know, musicians and going on the road and being caught in the moment of rock and roll, right? Mm. You were living both sides, but you were living it from the side of an observer. I started as a kid taking pictures when I was eight years old. I was the family photographer. But then I got into the rock and roll living with a rock and roll band. So traveling with a band later wasn't much of a stretch because I, I enjoyed living with musicians and going to the shows and, and that whole lifestyle, being up all night sleeping all day. <laughs> Did you play music too? I was in the folk music. Like in the early 60s when I came out, I was in the Hootenanny Club and stuff. But then when the Beatles came out, everybody started playing notes. And it got a little complicated. 
and I was better at taking pictures, and so the record company liked my pictures, and I started getting hired for other things. Do you remember your first big, like, memorable moment? Well, I think the Tina Turner picture that really started everything for me, that really captured all the excitement of Tina in one shot. That was a, a multiple exposure. It's actually, no, it's not a multiple exposure. It's one exposure. It was, a, it was a one second, but there was a strobe light flashing oh. that caught these multiple images of Tina. And I remember it was the end of the show. She goes off stage to a, with a strobe light, and I had a few frames left. And I thought, well, I wonder what will happen if I leave it open for a second and get a few of these flashes. Wow. And what's interesting is I had no idea where to focus the camera because it was just all moving. I had no idea what exposure it would be or when the timing would be. And, and a couple of the other shots I, I took are, you know, all over the place, the images. But this one, it just came out just right. And it changed my life. Because a couple of days later, I went with my friends to see another Ike and Tina show, and I brought the pictures to show my friends. And my friend happened to see Ike Turner walking behind us, you know, from one dressing room to another or something. He, she literally pushed me in front of Ike and said, show Ike the pictures. And he stopped, he said, what pictures? And he, he liked them, and, and he said, I gotta show these to Tina. And a minute later, I was in the dress room, and Tina was liking the pictures. And that's the first band I started traveling with. When you're traveling with a band, uh, a lot of times I find, you know, you kind of think you're gonna go someplace and really experience it. But like this, this picture is, this is, in, a this, is in, this is in Las Vegas. This uh, is like a, the camera on the shelf or something, yeah. on a timer? Yeah, on a timer. I really like it a lot. Yeah, I took it, took it with a timer. The amount of times that I actually really want to leave the hotel room and go and walk around and deal with, you know, I, I use that as a time to just absolutely do uh, as little as possible. And I, I have no problem with it. It's, it's, it's I, I like being alone. Most people have a problem with it, but you turn it into, you know, your art. Yeah, I mean, and, and this is, you know, that photograph is, to me, you know, it's just the light in Vegas is always that kind of, mm. you know, just right. blowing away. I was looking away. at such a bright spot from such a dark spot, you know, where it's calm and, you know, it's kind of like being in a cave where you're safe, but you're looking out into this bright world out there. Do you do self-portraits? Uh, often, yeah. Um, if nobody else is around to take my picture, I'll do it. <laughs> You spend a lot of time with the Stones. Oh yeah, yeah. For and me, actually, the first concert I saw in a theater was the Rolling Stones. I thought that rock and roll bands played in bars, and a friend of mine was selling tickets on the sidewalk, and I got to see the Rolling Stones by surprise, 1964, at the Academy of Music, and it was just blew me away. It was the most exciting, thrilling thing I'd ever seen. And for me, those Rolling Stones are the image of rock and roll. I mean, you just see them and, and you just, you know they're rock and roll stuff. What was your early moments of, of connecting to music? There was music in my house because my, my brother played, uh, my sister played, and I think I wrote my first song before I took an acting class. But I took so an that was So that was actually a first love? In right? a way, yeah. But speaking of photographs, I want to ask both of you guys, this is a question that's been interesting to me. Now, maybe it's just me, but why is it that photographs of musicians are so much more interesting than photographs of actors? So I don't know if it's just because I put musicians in, in a different category, but I can't imagine It's having... very surprising because an actor is kind of trained to project a personality, whereas a musician is doing a different kind of... But has anybody else responded in that way? Do you way? know what Bruce Springsteen said when I was photographing Bruce several months ago and he was talking about playing on the Grammys with all these great musicians? And I said, you know, what's that like to be in there and get together and collaborate? And he goes, man, he says, that's what they call it playing. Mm. They don't call it acting. From an acting standpoint, um, we talk a lot about uh, memory, sense memory, uh, using things from your own personal experience emotion, as, an, as an emotional basis to approach, you know, pretty much any scene. I was doing a scene in a movie that I did called Jay Mansfield's Car. That, and in the scene, I'm, I'm being told by my son that he's going off to Vietnam, that he's enlisting. And I'm, a, you know, a hippie, and, and it's basically just this really slow push in on my face. And I was like, how do I get myself there? And I picked up my phone and 
texted my son and I said, quick, send me a picture. And he did. He, he was on the road. He's in a rock band. He happened to be on the road in a van, some crabby van going someplace, and he just went, sent it, went to my phone, and it came like right before action. And that was it, you know, that was it. You know, one of the things about being with you guys in photography in general is that when I take pictures of the band, I'm so influenced by the work of the great rock and roll photographers. Because being such a fan of music, I also, as a, as a kid, you know, would, would just eat up any books, any photographs, anything that I could see of a band backstage, on stage. I went to countless, like, rock concerts when I was a kid. I was, like, sort of obsessed with not only the music side of it, but also the, the, the photographs as well. You know, the rock and roll is a, a, a style of music, but the image is so important. You know, they talk about rock and roll being haircut and attitude. And when you think of rock and roll, you'll remember songs, but you'll remember Elvis Presley with his, you know, guitar up in the air and his hips shaking and the sweat flying. And you remember certain images. The image that, you know, has a lot to do with whether or not you like somebody is what yeah. they look like, what attitude they're, they're putting out. I dress very differently for the different bands that I see. Hmm. You know, if I'm going to see Kiss, I'll have more leather than when I was going to see the Bay City Rollers, for sure, where I might even have a little plaid, which I almost never do. <laughs> Hence but, you, you know, tapping you into your stylist. Well, you, you want to feel moment. like they feel, and, and you kind of get into their image and actually participate in their image. I am a fan of a lot of the bands. I mean, I was a big fan of Johnny Yoko's. I remember walking down the hall to meet them, and I was shaking. And in the hallway, I realized that shaking that much, I wouldn't be able to take good pictures. And I stopped, and I took a deep breath, and I mm. said, the only way it's going to work is if I do what I do, and they happen to like it. And so I went in, and I did what I did, which is, you know, kind of stay out of the way, get some pictures when they look good. I don't give a lot of direction. I kind of wait until somebody's doing, uh, you know, looking good naturally. And, uh, and it worked, and they liked it, and they asked me to come back more often. <laughs> Do you have a connection with, you know, music icons and monuments? Well, I do tend to like the New York skyline, and, and it's just it's so magnificent and impressive, and, and people just kind of feel powerful when Statue they're Statue of Liberty. Of New York, you know, and, and the, well, the Statue of Liberty was a little different. John Lennon was involved in a, a legal case with the U.S. government was trying to throw John Lennon out of America, and he was very much wanting to stay, and I thought at the time that the Statue of Liberty was a symbol of welcome. One of the most seminal photographs for me in, in music, your picture of John Lennon with New York City skyline behind him. Yeah, I, I don't know why it's such a popular one, but he really seems confident and comfortable and kind of accessible. Even with the sunglasses, he looks like a pop star, but it, with his head tilted a little, he just looks accessible and friendly, and people just, uh, uh, are, they like it. He had an apartment with a penthouse roof. We were actually doing something else that day, uh, we were taking pictures for an album cover, and I did a whole series of close-up pictures of his face, doing different expressions for the Walls and Bridges album cover. And as a kind of afterthought, we said, oh, well, let's take some more pictures around the roof. And the skyline was all around us. I said, you still have that shirt I gave you last year, you know, and that New York City shirt? And he knew right where it was, and he went and put it on. And we had no idea that was the one that was going to be singled out as one of the most popular. Yeah, because I saw on the contact sheet, which is a wonderful record of where you went, the sequence. Mm. Right. He was wearing... Right. He was making a different a face. Denim, he a does denim He had a denim jacket, jacket on, yeah. And then the shirt jacket came off, the yeah. shirt, the shoulders, the whole thing. So you're not only a photographer, you're also a, a, a I styled stylist. that photo, yeah. Of, of, uh, <laughs> well, I cut the did sleeves off hair? the shirt. No, no, I didn't do his hair. He did that, but I cut the sleeves off the shirt uh, when you I gave did? it to him. did? When, when I gave it to him, it's more of a New York look. Another iconic photograph, working with a, a volatile band. 
and a volatile time of music, uh, an exciting time of music in, in, you know, in the course of when music was changing. Uh, there was a lot going on in the 70s, you know, starting with the glam era in the early days and the New York Dolls kind of influencing the Ramones who influenced England. At the same time that the disco movement was coming up and people were wearing death to disco buttons. I went more for the rock and roll side and, and partly because I knew the people. I met Malcolm McLaren when he was working with the New York Dolls and when I went to England a year later and he introduced me to the Sex Pistols and at the same place I met the Clash. And Was your relationship with the Clash an easy relationship? Did you, were you a fan and then you became a photographer? Well, it was. I saw them in the first year in 76 and I just kind of said hello to them one night. I came back a year later and I really wanted to see them because the show I had seen was just one of the most powerful shows and I wanted to see that Clash band again. You know, I like that he's got that a, I'd never noticed he has a yeah. New York Post t-shirt on. You know, this was a, a two days before <laughs> they were playing at Bonds in New York and uh, they'd oversold, the promoter had oversold it and they, the fire department closed it down so there was kind of a riot in, uh, in Times Square and the Post picked up on it and went Clash in Times Square, uh -huh. which is exactly why they picked the name because there were clashes all over the place. Awesome. But this one was actually about them. <laughs> But you uh, revisited your Clash picture with Green Day. Well, the roof on the RCA building uh, is about 20 blocks north of the Empire State building. And to me, it's the best roof in New York because you get to see the Empire State, which is the main Hold on, I need to write focus. this down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> rock band. <laughs> well, because it's the best place. Because many people think that if you get on top of New York, you want to go up to the top of the Empire State building and take a picture of all of New York around you. But then you miss the Empire State, which is the most important part of the skyline. Right. But if you go in the, the RCA building, the Empire State is right there in front of you, and it just says New York City. And then recently, when Green Day was uh, doing a live sh TV show in the studio, they did Saturday Night Live, is, so it, is shot from that building. And I said, you know, we're in the same building. I took the Clash picture. Do you want to go on the roof? And they went, well, yeah. <laughs> so were you actually recreating that photograph with? with well, not specifically, mm -hmm. but we were going to the same spot on mm -hmm. purpose, you know, mm -hmm. because the, the Green Day's a huge fans like I am of the Clash, and just the idea of going back to that same spot. but. In the 25 years, the technology is different. The Green Day picture is a digital color picture, which you know gives it uh, you know a whole different aspect to it. I, I photographed Green Day uh, a couple of times. But my first time, we were shooting for you know an hour, and at the end, you know they said, "Are, are we done?" And Trey said, "You know, are you sure you're done?" And I said, "Yeah, I'm." I'm totally done and he kicked down my entire set. <laughs> yeah, Trey will do that. Well, there's one Fucker. of the pictures. Wow. Knock it all down. He goes, I just wanted to make sure. So we oh, are done. Wow. Yeah, Trey is a, a loose cannon. So this uh, leads us to a segment called Fishbowl. I get to go into the fishbowl and ask the first question, which I will address to Bob. What is the greatest change in photography in the last decade? I think, you know, the fact that the camera uh, makes it so easy to take a picture, uh, combined with the fact that it's easy to get the picture out. Like, you used to have to figure out the math, figure out the f-stops, the focal length, the speed of the film, develop the film, make a print, mail it or send it somewhere. Now, you push one button, the camera does all the work, and then you plug it in, you put it in a computer, you push another button, and it's all over the world in seconds. You know, it's a little competitive, but you know, <laughs> now that everybody can take a picture. But, but here's the thing, everybody can't take a good picture. Well, that's, that's the what, truth. That, you know, that's uh, the thing. Is that, one of my pet peeves is that everybody takes 200 pictures at an event and then they put them all up on Facebook uh, or wherever. I think you should do editing. I take know. the one good one. Because my secret of success is that I edit and I take a lot of pictures and I pick out the good one. And if you just show good pictures, people think you're good. Yeah. Bob, why don't you grab one and ask Kevin a question? Okay. All right, this is fun. What well, separates the good photographers from the great ones? Oh, uh, well, that's, that's a... That's a really good question. I mean, to me, it's a simple answer, but it's it's a, it's just the thing is that you you look at the photograph and it, it moves you in some kind of way. It connect you connect with it emotionally. You can you can look at it again and again, and it can um, it can make you feel something. Well, it's like rock and roll. You can take the three same chords, right? And you can either you know write. Uh, imagine, or you can write something lousy. You know? I think I think you're exactly right because the way I think of it is that a, a good photograph can show you the facts of what's going on, but a great photograph can show you the feelings, mm -hmm. you know, and make you relate to the feelings.
there's a lot of intuition. You have to know what could be coming and be in the right place at the right time, ready to capture what hasn't happened yet. But you have to be there before it happens. Kevin, why don't you ask us a question and see if we can't all get into it a little bit. I hate answering questions, so I might just pass, <laughs> pass by this. Ah, uh, here's something good to talk about. Why is conversation becoming a lost art? Uh, I have nothing to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'll say two things. One is that one of the things I like about being an actor is that once you say action, you have to listen to the person that you're sitting there with. And a lot of times that's, that's to me, can separate the men from the boys, so to speak, in terms of good actors. Good actors are people that listen to each other and, and are honestly talking to the other person. Mystic River was one of my favorite movies of all time. And just as a, as a fan of, of that movie, can you tell me one quick little anecdote about that movie that kind of separated that for you from... Oh, uh, yeah, Mystic River was a great movie to make. Um, I had wanted to work with uh, Eastwood for a long time, and, and um, it's one of those weird things where you don't really audition for Clint. It's more kind of like you hear that maybe he's interested, and then you just sit there and hope to get the call. And what an incredible cast that you were. Yeah, yeah, yeah great cast. With. Great cast, and you know, just to, that was one of those ones where, you know, you, you hope that you have one good element in, in any gig, you know what I mean? You hope that, like, you really like the director, you really like your co-star, the script's great, the part, or whatever. Mm -hmm. This is one of those ones where, like, every day was fantastic. And we were in Boston. He shoots really pretty short days, so there was a lot of good hang to, um, you know, uh, to say the least. And uh, it was just a blast. We had a great time. So, Bob, I, I guess we're one degree from Kevin now. Oh, okay. <laughs> so this is this is going to raise the bump. I just figured out in, in my heart of hearts I've always been a zero. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for coming. Bob Gruen, Rock Scene, a new book coming out. And... The great Kevin Bacon, thank you so much for coming and sharing your work with us. Thanks, it's and been fun. I've enjoyed it. Your, uh, your new series comes out in January? Yeah. And you play? I play an FBI agent, ex-FBI agent, who's on the trail of a serial killer. I'm watching it. Please do. Well, this has been great. Thank you again for both well, of thank you for coming. Thanks Pleasure for having us. Hey, I'm Mark Seliger. If you like this episode of Capture, don't forget to like and share the video with your friends. We'd love to hear what you think of the show, so leave a comment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Are you serious? I'm sitting here with David Sally and Cause, and this is Artist Talk. Have you ever gotten into any legal problems? Nothing that wasn't controllable. You know, there's that fine line between um, creativity and just mania. I think if I wasn't a writer, I would be a neurotic, strange person that people would want to stay away from. It's like harnessing your OCD. Harnessing my OCD. <laughs> That's a genius. Hey, I'm Joy Bryant, and I am a board sport enthusiast. I like to shred. And on my new show, Across the Board, I'm going to be shredding with the best of them. I want to shred, yeah. Yeah, I want to shred. Yeah, well, let's do it. My favorite friends, celebrities, athletes, artists. We're going to snowboard, we're going to surf, we're going to skateboard, we're going to have a great time. <laughs> well, we both, you know, we both came over, you know, went over some hurdles. A yeah. little obstacle awesome say. Yeah. You break through shyness and uh, me. Breaking through that snow. What? Part. Tom, how's it going, Good, dude? How you doing? Good to see you, man. I don't know if you're going to make it or not. No, I mean, 5 a.m. is tough. Okay, here. What do we got right there? Shark, I see him right there. Oh. oh. All right, there, come on. This is the frisky one here. Yeah, be careful, man. Yeah, you, know, you have a reputation of pissing people off. Like your blog pisses people off. It, uh, it pisses people off. I, uh, this face pisses people <laughs> off, you know? But uh, yeah, I mean, sometimes, sometimes I get along. Did your dad, you know, was he on um, you constantly telling you how to do it since he was in the business? My dad was such a dick because he'll always tell me I suck. And then when he's in front of other people, that's my son. That's my son. He's real good. Jim. Only on YouTube.